All right. Um, okay. I think that's not messed up the proportions too much. Um, okay. So this was the uh, you know the proposal that I wrote um, you know for uh, for the session, um, contributing to the comments what, why, and how. So last 20 years, there's been a huge number of typefaces developed. And um, you know, for many writing systems or scripts around the world, there's been more done in the last 20 years than was done in the last like 200 years. So um, you know, there's been this huge explosion of cultural expression, and um, you know, part of that is that um, you know some people or organisations have decided to uh, make their fonts freely available, um, and not just in terms of you know zero dollar, you know zero euro, zero pound price. But um, also in terms of um, you know the, the sort of wider free cultural movement, and uh, maybe the world's biggest example of this would be the Wikipedia. So um, we'll get into exactly what that means, you know, the commons later. But there's you know this idea of commons, I think, is you know almost ancient, um, and um, you know is, is spanning people who um, you know are maybe students or hobbyists, you know, who who are not dealing with a lot of capital and money, um, but also some of the world's largest companies who do are in dealing with a lot of capital and, and money. So um, yeah, the SIL open font license. Uh, I want to talk about that, and um, I'm glad Victor has uh, is, is joined the session and is on the video here, and he's one of the co-authors of the license. Um, and uh, so yeah, great great to have him on. Uh, so I don't have to make up stuff. <laughs> you can talk about what it was what, what it was really like when it was being developed and what it, you know the intentions are and stuff. I don't have to you know try and. Um, Give, give my interpretation. We can hear it direct from the source. Um, and so, yeah, so so basically, yeah, uh, a lot of people ask me about this stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been really into it for a long time. And the uh, last 10 years, I've been working uh, uh, with or for Google um, on Google Fonts, where the vast majority of the fonts are under the open font license. And um, all of the ones in fonts.google.com are under some kind of, um, you know, Libra or Commons. Uh, you know, a license. So um, yeah, uh, I, I hope you know people might have questions about this, um, and um, let's 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 dig into it. So what what are we talking about? Well, you know, there's lots of kind of similar words that get bandied around, and you may have heard me say this word Libra, um, which is kind of unusual word, um, and uh, at least you know for someone as ignorant in English as as I am, uh, because it's a word in Spanish, French, you know, of a Roman. Uh, romance languages, I think, um, and and it's you know there's sort of ambiguity between this word free and this word uh, you know libra is is distinguishing that ambiguity in the word free because free can mean free as in price, but it can also mean free as in uh, freedom, lack of restrictions. And um, in the late 90s, then there was this change in the tech industry discourse around the word open, and um, Actually, the word in open type doesn't really mean open as in open source or um, you know open culture or open fonts. Um, it's it's open to the extent that it was developed by a single vendor, Microsoft, uh, initially, and it was open to other companies or you know um, individuals to to implement, um, but not necessarily that it was um, you know um, sort of part of the commons in in the way in which the um, sort of this idea of uh, a movement to give people not just zero dollar access, but um, unrestricted access to things. Um, so you had you know, these different software companies and they would make these sort of uh, attempts to create industry standards and they would call them open because it was that idea of it being a, a standard, yet it would still be under some kind of proprietary um, or, or even um, uh, sort of, um, what's that word? Well, under, under some kind of control. Um, so, so uh, yeah, basically the, all of these words are sort of trying to attempt to uh, describe the same thing. And then um, in the last 20 years, this word commons has been used, um, particularly because of this organization, Creative Commons, which is often uh, a range of licenses. And so let's get into that. So um, this, this, this fundamental um, you know, idea of freedoms, there's this famous State of the Union speech by US President FDR. Um, and uh, he had these four freedoms. Um, I think this was in like the early 40s in the run up to the Second World War. And so he was saying, uh, you know, in this in this speech that there were these four essential freedoms that he wanted to see, uh, you know, um, the uh, 
um, pe people around the world uh, could enjoy. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, freedom from fear. Sounds um, sort of uh, almost uh, kind of, uh, yeah, uh, very different to rhetoric you hear in America th these days. Um, so in the early 80s, uh, there was this guy, Richard Storman, who had this free software foundation, which he'd created to promote the development of software, um, which gave the users of the software also four freedoms, four different freedoms to the FDR ones. But it was kind of a joke, a lot of things around um, Richard Stillman and the FSF kind of jokes. So he, he's, he sort of has these, um, these essays and stuff you can read on the FSF website. Um, he had this idea of the freedom of a software user coming in four different ways. So you have kind of freedom for yourself, things that you can do, and then the freedoms which are uh, to do with other people, freedom of and freedom to. So freedom of usage, no restrictions on what you can use it for, field of usage, you know, commercial, non-commercial, um, you know, scale of usage, you know, how many copies you can have, how much you can use it, how many, you know, um, in terms of fonts, how many times you can, you know, use it in how many, how many documents can be produced to use it and this kind of thing. So you know, no restrictions on your own usage. And then also kind of private, you know, in terms of your private usage, freedom of modification. And for software, it's important to have the source files. Whereas with fonts, the, the binary that you get is not so far away from the source files. So having access to source isn't totally necessary. You know, you can crack open any font in a font editor. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you're sort of savvy and know what you're doing, you can kind of carry on. Yeah, if you're knowledgeable enough, Erin said, exactly. So, um, Okay, so so that's freedom of modification for yourself, and and that idea I think is you know that when you have um, software or or a font which isn't working very well, in some way, you can say well I this is not working for me, and I have the I'm knowledgeable enough I know what the problem is, and I know how to fix it, and I can go ahead and fix it for myself. So then the third freedom is is about file sharing and you know internet networks um, these days very easy to put a file up on the internet um, back in the early 80s uh, that was less the case and it was more sort of you know sharing on floppy disks you know and copying disks and giving them to people you knew but um, this idea of, of sharing you know co computers fundamentally are information copying machines and so um, this freedom to redistribute stuff um, is is sort of naturally there it's what computers do they copy and modify information and so um excuse me um the the uh those those sort of tech and the third things can be combined of course so if you've made a modified version and you're allowed to redistribute the original it's important to be able to obviously redistribute the modified version as well And so that that kind of those kind of natural freedoms that you, you naturally have are um are sort of restricted in a copyright regime where what you author is subject to um you know uh, copyrights and by default it's all rights reserved and if you do distribute a copy to somebody then they can't do anything uh, under the standard all rights reserved copyright regime. So. A lot of um, software or fonts that you uh, you know may be dealing with, you enter into contracts which give you permission to use the work in certain ways, and um, those contracts can have terms uh, you know beyond um, you know what is prescribed by uh, copyright. Um, and this is a little bit confusing because often these are called EULAs or end user license agreements, but in a sort of legal sense they're considered as contracts, whereas under copyright, you can also offer copyright licenses, which are not contracts, but they're um, within the bounds of what copyright is, um, uh, sort of what rights are being reserved, and that you can release some of those rights, you can you know, unreserve them and have sort of some rights reserved. And so a lot of this um, Libra open free stuff is operating in this way, um, where it's under a copyright license, it's like a pure copyright license and it's kind of some rights reserved. And that phrase, some rights reserved, was really popularized by this Creative Commons organization. And they offer a range of licenses. And so in the same way that we've sort of enumerated these four freedoms, then they have um, a, a range of licenses 
that allows you to sort of pick and mix what you want to uh, you know um, reserve and what you want to open up and uh, free up to you know the recipients of the work. So the Creative Commons licenses, almost all of them have in common this requirement for attribution um, and um, to let users know that the work has involved, you know, um, work that's under one of these licenses. Although there's a Creative Commons option called Creative Commons Zero, which tries to be as close to sort of public domain and, you know, just sort of your natural unrestricted um, abilities to do whatever you wanted um, uh, as, as possible internationally. And uh, so yeah, no derivatives, obviously, you know, that second thing about being able to make modifications or derivatives could be allowed or not. Um, a big concern is, you know, activity happening overall being commercial or not. Um, and then there's this sort of phrase like share and share alike, you tell kids. And so there's this idea that you can um, use copyright licenses to kind of do this kind of weird inversion. So when you provide a license to somebody, um, that allows them to, you know, do all these things. Um, there can be a, a condition on it which says that you have to share and share alike. Um, and so um, this idea, when it was being developed in the 1980s, became known as copy left as a kind of joke to say, you know, it's sort of reversing the typical purpose of copyright um, to restrict people's natural rights and and sort of try and guarantee them so that when you receive a work under the license, you can do all these things, but when you further redistributes it, you have to keep it under the same kind of license conditions so that the recipients to you also have the same kind of freedoms that you've enjoyed. Um, and so uh, this stands in contrast to some of the licenses that were developed by um, universities or university affiliated projects in the 80s. And so in the US, MIT, University of California, Berkeley had these software projects, um, which were, uh, you know, Unix uh, or you know, being, uh, they, were, they were software projects, and they were being sort of fully funded by the universities, and so they didn't see you know any any kind of use practical use for this kind of uh, copy left terms, um, and um, when you when you're doing this kind of stuff, when you're remixing stuff in this way, then you may be mixing different works together. You now it's not just that you receive one thing from one personal organization um, and then you add your stuff to it, you may be taking several pieces from different sources. And if those are un if those are under incompatible licenses, then you kind of get stuck. And so um, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, then um, the Free Software Foundation project issued what they called the lesser general public license, um, which sort of moderated that term a little bit and said, um, you know, if you combine these works, then um, the, the parts which were under this kind of copy left license have to stay that way. But the whole thing doesn't have to be licensed under the whole, the same license. It can be under um, incompatible licenses, even ones which restrict these kind of four freedoms. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's like with Creative Commons, there are these sort of scales of, of ways of saying some rights reserved, how much, so for fonts, um, there's this special license that takes into account the special situations that fonts get into because fonts, you know, are software in a sense, they're not hardware, <laughs> but they're, they're not really software like programs. There are fundamental natural differences between what a font is and, you know, what a typical software program is. And so um, uh, Victor Goldney, who's here on the call, uh, was involved in this project at um, his uh, em employer SIL. Uh, Summers Institute of Linguistics um, to develop a license that was um, not only for SIL's own fonts, but was open in a sense, you know, in the old school 80s sense, you know, to, to others to use. There had been some custom font licenses, but they had been per project. And um, so uh, the um, the SIL open font license is, is encouraged for everyone to use in their projects. And, um, you know, it, it was developed in this sort of, uh, you know, open communal way where there was a lot of input, people who were interested in around this topic at that time, uh, some 15 years ago, um, you know, so, so could comment and um, they tried to craft this license to balance essentially, you know, this sort of, you know, legacy of the, um, the free software movement, the open source movement, um, the creative commons movement, um, you know, Wikipedia, there's this sort of, you know, idea of, of making stuff really available. Um, and then there's the specific interests and needs of type designers. 
And so the SIO open font license, as I understand it, is this sort of trying to balance these two quite different communities and in interests and come up with something which is going to be really widely useful. And I think, you know, 15 years later, we sort of see that. So, um, you know, uh, wh why uh, would you want to do this? Um, I think my slide deck has just um, fixes. Here we go. Uh, okay, let me stop and restart this. Okay. All right, I think that's fixed now. Okay, so uh, so why? So why, why would you want to do this? Um, well, <laughs> sometimes, you know, uh, 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 fonts can be expensive. This is an old joke. Um, I don't know if this is still the case, but any old my fonts, you could you could tap all the numbers up to like 99999 and get like a crazy bill. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I think that um, for myself, you know, why did I become interested in, in all this stuff? Well, um, it, it wasn't really inter it wasn't really about this. You know, as, as a designer, you're in business. You can, um, you know, find ways to, um, uh, you know, uh, pay for paid font, retail font licenses. Um, you know, fonts do not cost uh, three trillion dollars or whatever this is. This is a joke, right? Um, so it, to, for me, it wasn't really about the cost. That wasn't very interesting. What was much more interesting was this um, idea of, you know, the, the modification and the issues. And the, I sort of see, you know, there's two ways in which things can can have uh, problems or issues. One is that the thing has problems with the way that it, it already exists. And so, uh, you, you know, you have a software program, it crashes, you know, you, you do the X, Y, Z, and a boom, it's gone. You've lost your work. It can be very frustrating. Um, and, um, uh, you know, in a font, maybe it's, maybe it's not going to do that but uh, it can cause your whole system to crash. But maybe there's something wrong with the font as it exists, you know, that like it's missing a kerning pair or, or you know, or no, no, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's um, the kerning pair that exists, but it's like not quite right. Um, but there's this kind of other class of um, issues, which is, which is more sort of elusive and that's where it's missing things. Um, and so this map actually is, is sort of um, to this point where I really, as a student became aware of this issue. So there was these, a uh, great series of events in London when I was a student at the uh, St. Bride Foundation. And um, this was some maybe 15 years ago. And uh, there was a great presentation by Thomas Finney when he was working at Adobe at the time, talking about their um, you know, open type updates to their library. And they've been expanding a lot of fonts with uh, Latin, Greek, and Cyrillic glyph set support. Um, and um, that glyph set that they'd chosen, he had this sort of map of the world and they showed, you know, these are the regions in which we do have support. These are regions where the support is a bit, you know, is, is a bit incomplete. And there's other regions where, you know, despite using um, the Cyrillic script and, you know, we've got so many Cyrillic glyphs, actually, we just don't, we really don't support that language in a, in a, in a solid way. So I felt, you know, as someone in London, as someone in a very privileged position, I wasn't experiencing this a lot. Um, you know, often the fonts that I have aren't really missing stuff, like they're not missing the, you know, the E that I need to write my name. But that, um, you know, for, for many people in the world, fonts are like that. And um, this old map is an old um, uh, uh, map from, yeah, the 1500s um, as a sort of early map of the world. And, uh, you know, I, I love this stuff because it's like upside down, the scale's kind of funny looking to us today. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's really important to have this kind of global perspective on things. Um, okay, so that was sort of what motivated me to uh, to get into this stuff. Um, if you wanna do it, if you wanna make a font and then make it freely available, um, contribute it to the commons, how would you do that? Well, there's sort of three essential things. So the first thing is you have to apply a liberal license and I really recommend the SIL open font license. Um, we can, you know, answer questions about that uh, specifically. But the second thing that you'll need is somewhere to put the sources. Now I said earlier, you know, maybe you don't exactly need the sources, but uh, obviously it's better if you do have them. And these days people have, you know, broadband, ubiquitous internet, 5G, whatever. And it's very easy to go on, uh, you know, do some web searches and go find the source files, you know, even if you didn't get them when you started 
uh, to use the font. So um, if you're making a font available, you should make the sources available. Even if it's not required by the license to do so, um, it's extremely helpful for creating this commons. And then um, the third thing is obviously you need a binary distribution uh, uh, plan. You know, how are you going to get these fonts out to users? And so, um, you know, today, um, you know, if, if I'm commissioning stuff from Google Fonts, put stuff out under the OFL, we'll put stuff on GitHub and, you know, we'll have fonts.google.com as a place where people can go and download it or use it directly as a web font using Google's fonts APIs. But that's not the only way to do this. And so, um, you know, other people use the OFL and they might use a different version control system to Git. One that I think is really interesting is uh, called Fossil. And this one has everything in the project file altogether. So if you have, you know, some kind of documentation um, uh, or, you know, a wiki or issue tracker um, or for your project, that may not be files in your version control system. And so when you are, you know, downloading the whole source project, you don't get all of that data. And with uh, Fossil, you do. And then there's this old project that I was involved in many years ago, fontlibrary.org, which is um, sort of a, you know, kind of Wikipedia style place. Anyone can upload a font to, to share it. And um, they have a, you know, sort of a catalog UI for, for these um, contributions. And um, uh, yeah. There's other alternatives. So bitbucket.com is relatively popular uh, alternative to, to GitHub, very similar kind of site. Um, and then um, there's uh, you know, this site, Use Modify, uh, by Raphael Bastide, a French designer who has sort of made his own collection of Libre license fonts um, and offers his own little catalog there. And the software to create that catalog is also Libre and available. Um, so if you want to create your own custom catalog, it's very easy to do that with, with his software. And of course, you can use your own page. You know, you can use your own website. Uh, Pablo Impolari used to have Impolari.com, been offline for a few years. Um, and that was what he was doing, where he had his own website and he had his own way of dealing with sources and sharing them um, and, you know, offering the specimens and, and all that. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, who does this. I think that's also very interesting over the last uh, sort of 15 years I've been involved in this stuff. I think I've seen that shift over time. And so, um, you know, one of the, I think the, the big things is kind of, you know, would be shocking to me 15 years ago is that people have been making OFL fonts, um, you know, who I wouldn't have expected maybe 15 years ago. So Adobe have Source Sans and Source Serif, IBM spot out Plex, Sans and Serif. And um, yeah, so some these sort of big tech companies are doing this. Um, it's not so surprising as they're technology companies and this sort of you know, free Libra software movement is, is a technology thing initially. Um, there's also been, um, in recent years, an increasing amount of branding being done in this way. And so um, LV, a UK insurance company, has made a OFL font, LiveVic. Um, DeepMind, another UK company, um, uh, which was acquired by Google, had also made its um, branding uh, available. And these are actually um, derived from other pre-existing um, of our fonts. So DM Serif is a derived from Adobe's Source Serif. Um, and then uh, Sora was was recently uh, published. Um, uh, again, you know, a uh, little, you know, I think that's a relatively smaller company. Um, and for their branding, they've commissioned a custom type and they want to make it freely available because it's helpful for that. They, they believe it's helpful for their brand to do so. And that's uh, somewhat, somewhat controversial. Um, and then uh, another aspect, uh, which is going back at many years, this example, so Paratype had released these OFL fonts uh, many, many years ago, also maybe like uh, 12, 15 years ago, long, long back. And PT Sans, PT Serif, um, I think is is really a, a really high bar for um, sort of fonts commons because these were um, typefaces developed for the Russian state. And it was exactly this issue, which um, you know I, I'd sort of uh, heard about from uh, Thomas Finney at St. Bride's when I was a student, where for, um, you know, uh, the federal Russian government, they had so many people who have, um, you know, all of these uh, names that are using these extended Cyrillic glyph sets, and many fonts, you know, were uh, not supporting those characters, and it was a real problem for the government to move to online administration. And so by making these fonts available, um, you know, freely, then that would mean that they could get everywhere they need to go, 
and um, could be used, you know, uh, anywhere so that those characters would really be supported and supported well, you know, with a sans and serif for real, you know, document typography. And of course, because this was being paid by public money, it sort of makes sense that the results would be available to the public. Um, and so I think, you know, there's the sort of interesting questions where, um, you know, other governments have, have um, been involved in the um, creation, dissemination of, of typefaces. Um, and even, you know, public broadcasters, uh, this kind of thing, I think it's a really interesting question about the use of public money in our little uh, type and typography domain. Okay, so that was sort of my yeah slide deck where I went through the the what, the why, the how, um, and uh, I'm very happy to open up to questions. So um, you know, if you have questions about why and how can you make your devices available to everyone in the world, I'm, I'm happy to to chat about that. Um, and uh, before we get into it, I saw there was something about uh, something about Google fonts. I think Henrik saying how did how did Dave answer the question why why free fonts like Google fonts. Uh, I, I hope I've answered that for my personally, you know, why I got really interested in this. Um, but, you know, uh, I, the, my purpose of, of holding this Q&A session is to talk more generally about the fonts commons um, and not specifically about Google fonts. Because while, you know, obviously Google fonts is a part of that, um, it's it's not uh, the only thing. And I wanted to talk more generally about, uh, you know, why and how and, uh, yeah. Okay. All right, so it looks like we have a question from uh, Aaron McLaughlin. Uh, any advice on how people who aren't connected to big tech can crowdfund or otherwise raise money to feed themselves while doing this sort of work? Have you seen any success stories? Well, I mean, um, uh, the even yeah, I think even the projects which are connected to big, big tech um, I mean, you say, you know, money to feed yourself. Well, um, you know, money, money doesn't go on trees. And, and I think, you know, it, it, people are inherently involved in, you know, um, laboring, right, in, like, in working to earn money. Um, and so, um, yeah, the, there's, you know, there's a broad global market for new typefaces. And um, for some customers in that market, then it's beneficial to them for their work to be available under these, um, you know, less restrictive terms so um uh yeah uh, i think for myself you know i went to the university of running studied the ma in typeface design as you did erin um as, as, as victor did and many many folks at atype i have um and you know with this intent i went going in with this idea that i wanted to work on um you know the fonts commons and um i had no idea what was going to happen <laughs> you know it was very risky and i was in a very priv privileged position where i could take that risk um you know, certainly as, as an English person um, going to an English university is, you know, uh, much cheaper <laughs> than it was for me than it was for you. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, I've, I've been able to, since graduating, you know, carve out a living for myself working on this. Um, and um, there's been a few people who have been um, involved in, uh, you know, free Libra uh, uh, open um, software fonts specific stuff over that sort of 10 year period or even you know 15 year period um but but those few people are very few and far between for sure and then there's you know a lot of people i mean we're talking about hundreds of people who've been involved in this stuff over the last 15 years um but very sporadically you know that's not their main thing and their main thing is being in the type of development market and sometimes their clients want this stuff to be libra and it is and other times it's not and they're making a living as type designers um, and um, I think that that's, you know, sort of the bit, a little bit, the, the nature of the beast um, is sort of, it's sort of a paradox because if you want to use computers like it was the mid eighties, <laughs> then the free software movement is amazing. You're done. You can completely use a computer the way that you would have in the mid eighties. Like it's the, the sort of, you know, the original, you know, you can look at the GNU project the BSD, you know, Unix projects um, of that period. And there were these projects that were these huge efforts to create this, you know, complete operating systems. And it took decades to do, but we are 35 years later and it's done. <laughs> um, and uh, in a certain sense, you know, you can think about that um, for a lot of NOTO projects. I like that, right? That you need a SANS and a serif, 
you know, or or something that's more traditional and more contemporary, something that's higher and lower contrast, because when you're doing document typography, you want to structure your text. And so you want to have these different textures for doing that. And so once you have a couple of fonts for a writing system, you're good to go. You know, why do you, why, and, and, I, and I've definitely, you know, I, no, 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 uh, no lie. I've definitely honestly seen, uh, you know, conversations with people who are coming from a more of a, you know, they're not coming from the graphics arts education background, we can say, right? They've had like a proper engineering education. And they say, why do, why do we need more fonts in Arial? You know, <laughs> I've got it on my computer. What are you talking about? And because uh, they don't, they don't appreciate, you know, the depth. And, and I, I often, you know, occasionally it's very rare that this comes up, but occasionally when, when I'm dealing with this kind of people, then I say, well, you know, imagine a magazine rack, right? If you're walking down the street in New York, you have these little magazine stands. Um, you know, there's going to be a magazine rack in the pharmacy or whatever, wherever you are. Um, and um, imagine all of those magazines and all of them are all in Arial for everything. You know, you can't imagine it. It's crazy. So, so uh, there's, there's, um, there's a certain truth, though, that there's sort of diminishing returns, right? That once you have a few fonts, um, you know, maybe you, you don't need so many more. And a lot of documents, you know, you see all the time are just using these, you know, fonts which have been uh, pre-installed and come with um you know uh, office productivity apps you know everywhere because people don't think to change the typeface when they're making their you know ephemeral documents so so um yeah i i, I think you know there's this sort of irony right in that the more that software is produced then the more free software is produced but at the same time it's proportionally getting like almost smaller in a sense i, I don't know if that's if that's true, if it's smaller, but but the the um the the constant need for progress is going to mean that no matter how many OFL fonts there are, there's always going to be more demand for more fonts and for custom fonts or retail fonts, fonts which most other people don't have. So um yeah, I think you know making a living as a type designer is hard enough. Trying to make a living as doing only Libra stuff is is pretty crazy difficult. Um, and um, I've, I've, in myself, you know, I can't even say that I'm doing it because I don't design typefaces. <laughs> yeah, I'm organizing, raising money to, to, um, to commission people to do it. And I've been doing that with one, you know, uh, in one place at Google for like 10 years. Right. There's a couple other scenarios um, that could jump in here. Here we go, um, please. Where uh, operating under an, an open system like this, is an opportunity for type designers to to make some money to make a living um, and one is to get custom commissions to take an existing open font and add stuff to it or to adjust it to change it for a particular purpose um, we as international were a while ago asked by a, a, a group in asia to create a special Bengali variant for them. Well, we didn't have the resources and they couldn't pay for the resources to have a whole new Bengali font designed. And so we said, well, hey, there's this good Noto Serif Bengali. Um, what do you need different about that to make it work for you? And so they you know, outlined exactly the things that, that they needed changed. We did those changes for them at a reasonable, you know, minimum cost. And that's one way. Another thing that happens here, particularly with minority scripts, is that the goal, I mean, what, I'm fully supportive of the Noto project. I think it's fantastic and everything. But of course, the goal for Noto is to have a font for every script. But really what we want is for every writing community to have a rich and vibrant typographic culture. That's really, now note was the first step in that, to have one font to start things out. The beautiful thing about that is because it's open, someone can take that Noto font and someone without the ability and the technical expertise to create a font from scratch for their script, can take that and create a different style based on it. And because of the licensing, they can do that. They can grab the Noto Sans whatever, 
and modify that to have a variant or, or design a completely different style. But within that framework that gives them a, a head start. And so having Noto or some other free font in that script enables local people to begin a typographic culture and maybe even start releasing some commercial typefaces. I can think of one in, in India where we have created a, an open font and someone else has an interest in a different design, but they're planning to do it commercially because, hey, they needed to make a living. And, and they're doing that. And that's fantastic. Thank you. I, yeah, I just wanted to say one follow-up because that's exactly what I was hoping we were going to get to that that idea that once you have a couple of fonts, then there's an opportunity for native speaking designers to actually like, you know, flourish. I think, but the only thing I know there's a problem because there's um, a disconnect between all the technical expertise that a lot of us here in Europe and the United States and stuff have that is that maybe other people don't have. And there's like, that's why I'm so, I kept poking Dave about like, we need the sources because, you know, like as many, um, pieces to the puzzle that we can give to people um, and tech, give people technical training so they can actually make that leap because it's so hard to get uh, educational opportunities for people to be able to then expand from the free ones and then turn it into an actual commercial enterprise that can sustain them, you know, teaching people how to fish rather than giving them the fish. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Yep. But anyway, no, thank you both for the answers. That was perfect. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so so actually, got? Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have a bunch of stuff that I, I, I want to go through. We have a bunch of questions as well uh, to move on to. Um, but I do want to uh, share my screen again and just point out one thing. So um, there was this great project, which um, Tyler Fink, who's a designer here in the US in upstate New York, um, did uh, about a year ago. Um, and so he, he created this uh, you know, whole website, um, Public Typeworks. And um, very beautiful graphic design. Um, you can see, you know, this this remnant of it on Dribble. Um, he had this website, Public Type Works, and I think if I click this link, link, you'll see the reason I'm saying it's a remnant is um, sadly that um, he he, um, he he considered the experiment a kind of failure. I think I, I think that's fair to say. And so um, yeah, it, we're not done, but we're imagining what to do after failing to fund any of the seven initial projects. And so, um, yeah, he, he set up this whole website, web app that was sort of like Kickstarter, specific to fonts, um, you know, and it was using that Kickstarter funding protocol, right? Where you have a, say, 30 day deadline, you have a target amount you want to reach, people pledge to it. And the idea was they had um, seven type, he'd find seven type designers who were willing to make a font and make it OFL if they got paid a certain amount, you know, and they weren't going to make the font otherwise, it seemed. Um, and, um, yeah, you know, he, he tried to get some, um, you know, attention on this and, um, yeah, I don't know, it, it didn't work out. Um, and, uh, yeah, I certainly, you know, thought these were all great projects and I, you know, tried to promote his thing in, you know, sort of my, in my social media, I think even the Google fonts account retweeted it. Um, and, um, yeah, he, he, uh, he did a great job there. So I, I'm really interested to see, um, what Tyler is going to do in the future around this, um, and you can sort of see yeah on pub on on um, product hunt then you can see still some of the screenshots about how it was working and um yeah it was it was a really great project i was very sad to see that he just kind of pulled the plug totally um and what i would love to see is actually more experimentation around these funding protocols because the way that kickstarter's model works is different to say patreon um you know which is more that you subscribe to the person Patreon.com. Nope, that's not it. I kill that. Um, yeah, Patreon is a different model. You subscribe to the person and you say, this person does great work. I'm going to pay them a dollar a month. And if, you know, a thousand people do, then, you know, they, they're, they're going to be able to carve out more of their time to, to do this thing that we love doing. Um, there are other funding models, I mean, protocols out there. And um, but maybe, you know, fonts needs its own license. Maybe fonts needs its own funding protocol. I don't know. Um, OK, so uh, let's see. So um, we got some more questions here. Oh, the screen sharing wasn't working. Did nobody see anything of Public Type Works just then? That's right. Oh. Uh, 
I'll just say that it is difficult, even for a large charity, to, to raise funds for font development. Um, because it's it's something that people have a hard time understanding. Why? Why fonts? It, it, it's, it's hard for them to comprehend. And so you really have to make a good case for it. We're really hoping to experiment with some Kickstarter uh, projects. Um, one in particular for um, for Latin, Latin handwriting font construction kit, essentially, for education purposes. But it's hard. It's hard to figure out how to how to do that well. Um, it's tricky. Yeah, I mean, I think the the, the essential thing, like I, I kind of skated over, is are paying for tight development. Some of them it's more valuable for them to have the fonts be freely available. And I kind of hit the jackpot when I graduated, right? Because I started working with Google, who've got billions of dollars. And uh, it's very beneficial for them to have all these fonts available. And, you know, that's why, why it's happening. Um, you know, it's sort of an Occam's razor argument. I'm not spilling any, you know, massive company secrets here. It's, it's very simple. Like uh, you have a customer who wants type to, to be created and it's more valuable for them to be for it to be publicly available than to be private to them or you know on some kind of retail or in between license and um often that means that you have to pay the full cost of the development um and a lot of foundries you know when a customer approaches them and says we're interested in commissioning a custom typeface then there's a kind of deal where they say well here's the full price if you want to take total take on the total ownership right it's your brand it's your asset you want to own it great here's the top tier price and then here's some kind of intermediate prices where we're going to keep the ownership and eventually retail it, and it's going to become part of our retail library. But um, you get exclusivity for a certain period, you know. And the more exclusivity, maybe uh, you know, the the um, the more the price, because we're sort of accounting and thinking there's going to be this retail revenue, and so we're kind of going to um, you know shift that revenue onto you and in increase the price to you, or lower the price if you want less exclusivity. And then there's this kind of weird inversion where if you say, well, we don't want any exclusivity, we want it actually to be a Libra font, then the price goes back up to the top, right? So um, yeah, this is what I mean about the funding protocols uh, that, that there, there are possible. And so I think, yeah, public type books was really interesting. It was one attempt um, way back uh, in 2011. Um, we did, I was involved in organizing some Kickstarters for some front projects. Um, and you know, one of my friends and colleagues, Octavio Pardo, uh, had also um, tried to do a Kickstarter um, for for a front project, and yeah, it, it, that one didn't work out. Um, so yeah, I think that the the trick to doing these things is to find people who are gonna benefit more from the thing the thing being freely available than other ways of making it available, um, and then it's really easy. Um, but finding those people is 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 tricky, and um, there's, I think this, this idea of the protocol is about finding that alignment of incentives that makes the, 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 um, the result happen in, in a more reliable, predictable way. Okay, so um, uh, Justin had a comment, the future fonts model is working well as a hit. I'd love to see a world where there are multiple platforms running that model. Um, yeah, I think you know, that, that um, future fonts is, is really interesting, really great um, you know, project uh, for, for uh, typographic culture. And um, in in um, in many ways, you know, has this kind of unique to fonts funding um, protocol, and I think that there's yeah there's room to explore there. Um, okay, Thomas Finney crowdfunded one of his fonts, right? Right, that was Cristoforo, um, and he did it twice. There we go. Yep, and uh, really interesting on Thomas's blog, he has some really interesting analyses of of how all that worked. And um, Dave. Because, Yep. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, Evan, I believe, has been waiting very patiently with a oh, couple questions. Right on. Yeah. Evan, go, go ahead whenever you like. Thanks, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I just put in the text uh, what the question was, but um, the question I was wondering about is, what do you think the commons needs the most? Like, um, you know, you'd sort of look out and say, okay, here's a bunch of people and they need stuff. You know, what are the priorities? Why are those the priorities? And But because this has been going on for a while, a uh, certain set of folk have kind of had their needs met to a certain extent. Another set of folk maybe haven't had their needs met at all. Um, does that factor into the way you're thinking about things? What do you think should be the priority? Why do you think it should be? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, something that I see 
so not for myself personally, but something I see out in the community is, um, you know, a, a very big interest in revivals. And so, um, for example, there's a designer, Owen Earl, whose foundry is indestructible type. And he's been doing, you know, this sort of series of, of very, you know, sort of close revivals of, of um, you know, long, long classics. And um, uh, Frederick Brennan also, who's here at the A-Type Pi this year, is, um, has also been, you know, working on revivals. And, um, you know, these are, these are sort of, uh, you know, of early in their journey to you know mastering type design and so um taking on these projects maybe is you know something which is more, more suitable for them uh they feel is more suitable for them i guess um but but that they're making these fonts making them freely available because they see the need to do that um and um uh yeah there's been a few i commissioned a few things like that with pablo and polari libra baskerville libra franklin and so on um so um yeah, I think that's because, you know, some of these these sort of, uh, you know, Vox classification style, you know, Canon typefaces, you know, have, have built up this cultural meaning around them. And so um, people want the, um, you know, freedom to be able to play with with that, you know, cultural, in, in tune with that cultural resonance. Um, uh, and um, for myself, that has not actually very been very interesting. You know, I, I, I as I say, I've been involved with, with Pablo and some of these Libra Libra, this Libra lat projects, but um, for me, it's much more interesting to commission new stuff that's visually new and, and interesting, uh, and um, not just you know reviving old 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 designs. Um, so um, uh, yeah, I think over the last ten years, you know, there's sort of been three sort of major kind of errors of my efforts. So there was this explosion of lots of fonts of U.S. English. Um, and um, you know a lot of display stuff, also some tech stuff like Evans, Merriweather, and then um, you know I spent a few years working on more multilingual stuff, a lot of Indian stuff, stuff in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, um, and um, uh, the last couple of years, you know, we've been focused a lot on this variable fonts technology stuff, and um, you know that's been sort of both stuff which has got a very basic glyph set it's more experimental and you know stuff which have more extensive glyph sets and you know across many scripts all of the almost all of the moto fonts at this point are now variable fonts as well so um i think you know the the the, the ubiquity of libra fonts is very interesting and that as we develop new font technologies it's expensive to invest in developing um you know type that uses these new technologies, and that by developing Libra fonts for the new technologies, that can help the um, you know, implementers, the technology platforms, implement support because they have test fonts to you know test their implementations against, and the, um, that it sort of paves the way for users to become acquainted with the technology to experiment with it. Um, you know, because it is free of charge at the point of use and they can just, you know, um, check it out um, without a lot of risk on their side. And then, you know, over time, it becomes this ubiquitous thing. And, um, uh, you know, people will say, well, well, there's this other font that I've got, which is not a Libra font, and it doesn't have this technology. You know, it doesn't have, it's not a variable font. It doesn't have a variable weight axis. It's just got a set of nine weight instances. Why not? You know, I want I want to buy this new version because I want this this new stuff that I've got used to because of being using Libra fonts. So I think that you know for the the kind of wider type culture, Libra fonts have this very important role to play in in um you in sort of ubiquitizing new marginal technologies. Um, I thought so, I had a really leading question there, and that you were going to give us a totally different answer. <laughs> oh, you exciting! I, thought, I would say. I, I I thought you were going to you were going to talk about North Africa, and I thought you were going to talk about uh, Indic scripts that still don't have any fonts, and stuff like that. Um, when I asked the question, well, I think we've already discussed that. Though. In a sense, we've already discussed that. Like Victor, you know, I think you know made that point very clearly. Um, that you know. You know, Ariel and Times Roman isn't enough. Note Sans, Note Serif isn't enough. And you know, you, you want this rich culture, of course, for all, all writing systems. And um, that I think is something which is best, you know, done indigenously, right? Um, and that that the, there's this sort of you know universalist aspect to a project like Noto, like a pan Unicode font project, 
um, which which doesn't entirely make sense. Um, you know, and so uh, you know, Victor's lecture this this week at ATI Bio was about italics, and um, you know, there's a great question for many writing systems that don't have something which which the italic concept can be translated into, right? That, that it doesn't make sense, and um, if you you know play with some of these attributes to make something which allows you to emphasize text, that's very helpful, but it's not. Um, it's not exactly the same thing as as an italic, so I think that um, you know what we're seeing, you know, with the further, you know, kind of um, you know, 21st century democratization of type. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm very excited, you know, for people to do that, and um, you know, I guess Taryn's point, you know, they maybe are going to be hobbyists doing it initially, or you know, these big companies doing it. Um, uh, but um, uh, yeah, I think that the um, the needs for, um, you know, um, uh, for example, you know, I, I work with a lot of type designers uh, from Argentina, and some of those projects, you know, specifically had an interest in supporting the extended Latin character sets that are in Unicode for the indigenous languages in South America, um, which a lot of fonts don't have support for. Um, and um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm all for all that stuff, but it, it kind of goes without saying. All right, everybody. Well, um, I do hate to interrupt, but we are just about out of time here. Please, please, please bring this excellent discussion to the Hangout Room. Um, just want to say thank you, Dave. Thank you to everyone who is brave enough to jump in and ask a question. Um, this has been really wonderful. And yeah, uh, the Hangout Room is on the sort of front page of the A-Type I conference. Hop on over there and please continue this wonderful discussion. All right. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Yeah.